Good morning and welcome everyone. If you could find your seats, we're going to get started here. Good to see you all this morning. Welcome to those of you who are visiting for the first time. I'm glad to have you here worshiping with us at Grace Bible Church. Um, we do have a visitor's booklet for you if you didn't receive it on the way in. Uh, you can see one of the ushers in the back before you leave today, and uh, we'll make sure to get you that, that booklet so you can learn a little bit more about us as a church. Um, our announcements today, page 13, um, something to be aware of, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, the office will be closed on Thursday and Friday, so November 24th, 25th. Uh, just note that in case you were planning to come by for something, uh, there won't be anybody here. Uh, December 3rd, uh, a group will be going to Lamb's Players Theater. Uh, you can talk to Lynn Kaser if you're interested in being a part of that. Her contact info is there uh, in the bulletin. Also on that same day, December 3rd, we're having another clothing exchange. And so there's, uh, there are opportunities for you to help uh, to put that together. So if you're interested, um, you can contact Daylin Romo. She will point you in the right direction. And then also one last uh, save the date uh, reminder, December 4th, we'll have our monthly fellowship meal. So after, after the church service, there'll be uh, seating both upstairs in the fellowship hall and depending on the weather outside as, as well. But um, it's always a, an enjoyable time to spend uh, time uh, in fellowship over a meal like that. So uh, you can make plans for that. Uh, this morning, we also have the pleasure of receiving new members, and so I'm going to have Ted and Catherine come, and Michael and Adriana. The, the part everybody loves, having to stand up on the platform. So on my left, we have uh, Ted and Catherine Bramble, and then on my right, Michael and Adriana Costanza. Um, we're very um, just happy to have these couples here with us at Grace Bible Church to be uh, joining us in, in membership, adding to the, the congregation here that with their, their presence and also their, their gifts. And so um, let me pray for them as we welcome them this morning. Our God and Father, we, we thank you for the presence of these couples in our congregation, for their fellowship with us, for their shared faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that uh, as they're here worshiping with us, we may all be able to join our voices together in one voice to glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, welcome. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 100. It's printed there in your bulletin on page three. We're gonna read it responsively. I will read the, the regular print and then together we'll all read the, the bolded print. And if you're able to stand, I invite you to stand now. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness of all generations. I got a little ahead of you on verse three, but you handled it well. <laughs> Let's pray together. Our God, you truly are good and your steadfast love and faithfulness are our confidence. We pray that today you would deepen our trust in you. We pray that you would fill us with joy and gladness because of all that you've done for us through your son, our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. And would you help us to sing your praise today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to join our voices together as we sing, O Great God, and then How Great Thou Art. God of high 
The scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1 through 7. And you can find that in your bulletin or in the Pew Bible on page 656. This is God's word. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles 
and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the office, officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The reading of God's word. Please pray with me. Lord, we bow our hearts before you now in prayer and acknowledge you as the great king over all. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. You are holy, 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 self-existent, the one who was, who is, and who will be, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally one God and our God. Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in more ways than we can even number, in thought, in word, and in deed. We so easily look for life and blessing in the poisoned pleasures of this world. We so easily believe the lie that we can find fullness in created things. Lord, awaken us to your glory. Cause your face to shine upon us through Jesus Christ. Lead us to the rock that is higher than we ourselves. Help each of us today to believe the gospel, that in Christ we are fully known and fully loved, that we have been by faith united to Jesus and have become partakers of his divine life and love. We thank you for sending your son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you for the spirit who is the guarantee of our new creation inheritance. Please sanctify us by that same spirit. Make us more like Jesus. Form us according to his image and help us to love as he loved. Give us compassionate hearts for those who have been wrecked by the wages of sin. Give us wisdom to know how to walk in this time and this place as exiles and pilgrims in Babylon. We ask that you bless our nation and give our elected leaders wisdom and a heart for true justice. Put within them a heart to do good. And we pray for their good and for their salvation. For you are rich in grace to all who call upon you without distinction. May we as your people be salt and light in the city in which we live. Give us eyes to see as you see, that we may see our neighbors and the poor and needy among us, all as precious people who need to see and experience the love of God in Christ and in us, your church. Stir our hearts again today for more of you. By your word and spirit, Draw near to those who are cast down and in darkness among us. Help the weak among us. Heal the sick among us. Give grace for every unseen trial and burden being carried. Lord, you see and you know. Lead us to green pastures and to still waters, for you are our shepherd, and we are the sheep of your hand. And now feed us with your word through song, through preaching, and the signs and symbols you have ordained. And we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand if you're able and join us in singing My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Titus, chapter 3. Uh, Titus, chapter 3, you can find that on page 998 in the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow along there. We have been working our way through the book of Titus over the past several weeks, and the theme for our series is adorning the gospel. And that comes from a phrase in chapter 2, where Paul urges Christians to adorn the gospel with their lives. In other words, to show off the, the beauty of the gospel's transforming power by how they live. And so, you see, the, the gospel is not merely a set of truths to which we assent. It is a system of doctrine that we believe and confess, but it, it's also a transforming power. The gospel shapes how we live. And so in chapter 2, Paul talks about gospel-shaped living in private life, we could say, in the home, in the church. And then in chapter 3, what, what we're going to begin looking at today, Paul talks about gospel-shaped living in public life, in public life. So let me read our passage. We're going to be looking at Titus 3, 1 through the beginning of verse 8. Paul says this to Titus, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of, our, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. Let me pray for us as we come to God's word. Our gracious God, we, we need your help this morning to understand your word. We pray that by your spirit who dwells within us, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, receptive hearts to receive your word today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've got to love God's providence. Last Tuesday was election day, and then here we are today, this, the following Sunday, hearing Paul talk about how to relate to our government. And, and Craig and I did not plan this this way. This is just kind of the way the, the schedule worked out as we um, made it up for Titus. You know, the the lead up to an election, I, I find it's always a bit of a, an emotional roller coaster. You know, the, the days leading up to it and then even the days afterward. You know, many people went to bed on Tuesday night um, worried, concerned, others perhaps um, hopeful. And then all of us woke up on Wednesday, and depending on where you landed on different issues, your, your fears were either confirmed <laughs> or maybe your fears were relieved. And, and however you felt about the election's outcome and what it might mean for our state, for our country going forward, uh, we as Christians, we as a, a church, are called to live gospel-shaped public lives. You see, the, as I said a moment ago, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ not only transforms how we live in private, how we, how we live as Christians in, in our families, how we live as Christians in even the church, it also transforms how we live in society, how we relate to the government, how we interact with neighbors, and, and particularly Paul in this passage has in mind non-Christian neighbors, people who believe differently than we do, people who think differently than we do, people who have different values than we do. And, and Paul does two things in this passage. He, 
He talks about what gospel-shaped public life looks like, and then he shows how such a life is possible. And so that's going to be our outline today. Number one, what a gospel-shaped public life looks like, and number two, how this kind of life is possible. So first, what a gospel-shaped public life looks like. What does it look like to live as gospel people in society? And Paul here in these verses, he says two things. Uh, Number one, it looks like being good citizens. Verse one, he says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. You know, so we're, we're called as Christians to be responsible, law-abiding citizens, to show respect, to show honor, even, Paul says, obedience to government authorities. Now, let's be honest. Uh, we're a bit uncomfortable with that kind of language. Submit to the government. Obey the government. I mean, we have enough human history behind us to know that, that many human governments are quite oppressive. Um, and then even as Americans, we just have baked into us a suspicion of governmental authority. And then often, quite simply, we, we just don't like the people who are in positions of authority over us. They, they don't always represent you know, our, our values or share our priorities, and we, we might be frustrated or even angry about their policies. And it's important to, to recognize Paul doesn't harbor any illusions that this, this command, this way of public life is easy for Christians. Uh, the, the churches on Crete, where Titus is, they're in a difficult position. I mean, they, they have pagan rulers <laughs> governing in pagan ways. And one ancient Greek historian said this about uh, the, the culture of Crete. He said, it's impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than in Crete. And, and we've talked about the, the bad reputation that Cretan culture had. Even so, Paul here and in Romans 13 and likewise Peter in 1 Peter 2, uh, teach that our basic posture, our, our Our basic posture as Christians ought to be respectful submission and obedience to government. Uh, Paul teaches in Romans 13 that that human government has been instituted by God. It's a a common grace gift, uh, really designed to restrain evil on the one hand and to protect human life and property on the other. And so the the New Testament unanimously says, Submit to that authority. Honor that authority. Now, of course, there, there, there are limits. There are limits. Um, Christ's authority is ultimate, not the state's. And so when the government commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands, we as Christians have to resist. We have to disobey. You know, we, we take the Acts 5.29 response, the the apostles there in the early days of the church, or the authorities in Jerusalem, tell them to, to stop preaching the gospel, to stop preaching in Jesus' name. And, and they answer, we must obey God rather than men. Now, we're very quick to focus on these exceptions. We're very quick to say, oh, okay, Paul says submit to the government, but let's talk about when, all the ways that that shouldn't happen. Um, but those situations are not the norm. They're not the norm. Our our basic inclination should be submission to governmental authority. Paul says we're to be good citizens, uh, ready for every good work, he says in verse 1. So so first, a a gospel-shaped public life looks like being good citizens, but Paul also says it looks like being good neighbors. Verse 2, verse 2, being good neighbors. And, And Paul Specifically here, he he focuses on our words and attitudes toward people outside the church. He he says, speak evil of no one. In other words, slander no one. Um, How much of our political talk does this rule out? Or or maybe the conversations in the break room at work about the boss or, or other coworkers. You know, it's easy for us as 
as Christians to kind of huddle together and, and talk about how awful those people out there are. You know, if we really took this to heart, what Paul's saying here, slander no one, I, I'm guessing we'd speak fewer words each day. You see, gospel-shaped people use their words to bless, not to slander. And Paul goes on, he says, avoid quarreling. Uh, Stephanie showed me a, a short video recently. In the video, there's this cute little girl. I, she's probably about three years old. And she says to someone in her family, uh, do you want to fight or be nice? And, and, and many of us are eager to fight. We would answer that little, that little girl with, you know, our, our fists ready to go. Uh, we're, we're argumentative. We, we engage on social media like it's a boxing match. Paul says gospel-shaped people are peaceable people, people who pursue peace, people who make peace as much as possible. And then he, he says, be gentle and show perfect courtesy toward all people. And, and notice how, how universal that is. Don't just be nice to your tribe, but to all people. And, and gentleness and courtesy, that, that, that word courtesy could be translated meekness or, or consideration. These, these character traits, they're the, they're the opposite of severity. They're, they're the opposite of, of roughness or, or an explosive temper. You know, Jesus describes himself as gentle. He says in Matthew 11, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Paul speaks of the meekness and gentleness of Christ in 2 Corinthians. And so Paul here in, in, in these exhortations, he, he's calling us to, to public lives where we treat people the way Jesus treated people. You know, over the, the past several years, American public life has, has gotten really ugly. I, I know it's been trending that direction for quite some time, but you, you might feel like this too. It seems like we've sunk to new lows. Um, uh, you, you've probably read reports about uh, the, the growth of polarization, uh, tribalism, and, and maybe you've experienced it even in your own social circle, perhaps even your families. You know, uh, Americans don't debate issues and respectfully disagree any longer. We demonize. And, and you know, you, you have labels like fascist, Marxist, or, or whatever, just thrown around like it's, it's no big deal. And as Christians, we swim in these cultural waters. This is the, the society we live in. And, and they, it influences us. And, and often without us even realizing it. And if we're not careful, we will embrace worldly approaches to public life. You know, we, we may make the mistake of, of thinking that owning the libs is something Jesus taught. If we're taking our cues from the talking heads on Fox News or MSNBC, uh, we're just going to blend right into the mess. We're not going to be a distinct gospel community. We'll just be some other partisan group. And so Christ, through his apostle here in Titus 3, he's, he's calling us to a different way of being a Christian in public. A different way. And, and we as a church and, and really as individual believers, we have a, a real opportunity Right now in this cultural climate, we have a real opportunity to commend the gospel in, with our public lives. You know, you, you imagine a, a community in, in today's world that, that resembles what Paul is talking about here. A, a community that's peaceable. A, a community that's respectful. A community that shows honor toward authority. Shows honor to, toward those outside of its own circle. A community that's, that's eager to do good, ready to bless. Uh, a community that's gentle and considerate to, to anyone and everyone. Uh, a community that embodies the beauty of the gospel. That kind of community will stand out. <laughs> that, that will catch people's attention. Now, some will see it as a threat. 
And we, we have to understand that. And, and in many ways, it is. You know, the church is a, a witness to the rule and reign of King Jesus it, and a sign of his coming kingdom. And, and in that sense, the, the church is a reminder that the days are numbered for the world's oppressive governments. The days are numbered for um, unjust economic systems, for corruption and, and greed. And so in, in many ways, the church is a threat to that way of life. But others, others, some will be curious. Why are you people like that? <laughs> uh, why aren't you just, you know, chewing up and spitting out everyone that disagrees with you? Um, tell me a little bit about this king you follow and, and this gospel I've heard you mention. And so, this is the kind of public life, a, a gospel-shaped public life that, that Paul here calls Christians to. Now, second this morning, how is this kind of life possible? You know, verses 1 and 2 alone are not enough. Um, we can't stop there. You know, okay, be like this. Well, well how? how? How is it possible? Um, why? Can we live this way? Why can we be these kinds of people? Notice there, if you look at, at verse 3, it, it begins with the word for. So Paul says, you know, live this kind of gospel-shaped public life. And then verse 3, for. Here, here's why. Here's how. And verses 3 to 8 are, are the gospel truths that shape our public life. And, and Paul tells a story here. He, he tells a story, and he wants us as Christians to live inside of it. It's a two-part story. Part one, who you were outside of Christ. And part two, how God has treated you. And, and what Paul's doing here is he's telling us that as, as we remember this story, as we live inside this gospel story, our public lives will look more and more like verses 1 and 2. And so the, the first part, who we were, verse 3, this, this snapshot of who we were outside of Christ, and it's not a flattering picture. <laughs> it, it's not a pretty picture that Paul paints of us before Christ. He says we were foolish and disobedient. Now, that doesn't mean we lacked intellectual ability. We were moral fools. <laughs> we were living in defiance of God's good rule over us. He says we were led astray and enslaved. You know, you and I were under this delusion that, that we were the masters of our own lives, that, that we were in control of things, that um, we could just decide what we're going to do and, and do it. In reality, Paul says we were mastered by disordered desires. He talks about various passions and, and pleasures. We were, we were mastered by our lusts. We were enslaved by our anger. We were captured by our desire for control. And, and the list could just go on and, and on. And Paul says we, we lived, our lives were marked by malice and, and envy, hated by others and hating one another. You know, our, our lives were just full of, of relational dysfunction and, and brokenness. And, and I read this I read this description here, and I think, how did Paul get access to the video of my life? <laughs> I mean, how did Paul know writing so long ago? And, and you may look at your own life and, and think the same, and, and you look around at the world, and you, and you realize how um, right on the mark Paul is about life outside of Christ. And, and even if you grew up under the influence of the gospel, and you don't have some you know, wild, rebellious past to speak of. This is a snapshot of every single person outside of Christ. This is who we are by nature. This is the ugly truth about our sin and, and who we once were. And, and you might hear what Paul says and, and think here, well, there goes Paul again, just trying to, you know, make me feel terrible about myself. And, and realize that's not Paul's goal, okay? Paul's goal here is not to shame you, but rather to encourage humility. 
He, he's saying, remember who you were. Remember what it was like before you met Jesus. Let, let that attitude, let that memory shape your attitude. Let it shape how you relate to non-Christian neighbors, you know. Re remember what it was like to walk in those shoes. You know, there, there's no place for self-righteousness. There's no, you know, there's nothing uglier than a Christian with a holier-than-thou attitude. I mean, of all people, of all people, we who have experienced the, the grace of God should be the most humble. We know we, we know and agree with what Paul says here in verse 3. We, we don't argue about it. We say, yep, you're right on the mark there, Paul. That's who I was. I was powerless and helpless to change myself. And, and we can be forgetful people sometimes, can't we? You know, especially if, if you've been a Christian for, for a length of time. And, and forgetfulness is always dangerous in the Christian life. You know, whether it's forgetting uh, who we were, or forgetting God's grace toward us. And so Paul says, number one, part one of the story, this is who you were, but he doesn't leave us there. <laughs> and part two of the story, how God has treated us. You know, Paul says, we once were this way, but no longer. We once were this way, but, but God, Paul says, saved us. He, he broke into our lives with his grace. And, and you notice there in, in verses 4 to 7, it's just one long sentence uh, beginning with, but, when God. Um, this, this sentence, Paul calls it a trustworthy saying there at the beginning of verse 8. And he, he quotes a number of these kinds of sayings throughout the pastoral epistles. Uh, many scholars think these words, verses 4 to 7, uh, come from an early Christian hymn or possibly a, a creedal statement. It's even possible that new converts recited these words at their baptism to just uh, give expression to gospel truths. And whatever the case may be, it's this beautiful, compressed summary of God's grace in salvation. So, so what, we should ask, what changed? How can Paul say, you once were this way, but no longer. Well, he tells us, verse 4, God's goodness and loving kindness, meaning his, his love for humanity, his goodness and loving kindness appeared. It appeared. And he, he's pointing to a moment in, in salvation history, that moment when God the Son stepped into our world as a human being. That, that, that moment when God's goodness and loving kindness appeared is, is when Jesus came into this world. He's the embodiment uh, of God's kindness and generous love. You know, if you want to know what God's heart is like, if you want to know um, who he is, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He is God's goodness and love made visible. And that's really Nowhere clearer than at the cross where, where God gives what is most precious to him, namely his son, over to death so that we might have life. And so in, in Jesus' own self-giving love, in his sacrifice of himself, we see the generous love of God. And, and Paul answers this, the question of why. <laughs> why did God save us? Why did this God in his goodness and his love send his son? Well, you know, maybe you remember playing kickball in elementary school. Maybe some of you played kickball in elementary school. You know, when it came time to pick teams, who got snatched up really quickly? It's always the really athletic kids, right? I mean, they, they just go like that, and then the rest of us are just, you know, standing around hoping somebody at least acknowledges our existence. Now, we were not the kids that got picked when it, came, when it comes to salvation. You know, not before God. We're, we're the verse 3 kids, verse 3 people. But Paul says, God showed us mercy. Verse 5, he saved us not because of works done by us, but according to his own mercy. God is rich in mercy. God extends mercy to people who don't deserve it. 
Uh, what was his response to us? Uh, we who were foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, and full of malice and envy and, and hate. What was his response to us? It was mercy. It was goodness. It was love. In a word, it was grace. And Paul goes on to talk about three gifts of, of grace in our salvation as he just kind of marvels over what God has done breaking into our lives through his son. He talks about three gifts of grace. The first one, new life. Verse 5 again, that God saved us according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We were those filthy, dirty, polluted people of verse 3, our sin had stained us. God washed us clean from the pollution of our sin. We, we've received a, a new birth. Regeneration is the word Paul uses. A, a new beginning. Inner renewal. New spiritual life through the work of God's Holy Spirit. So we've, we've received a, a new life. Second, we've received a new status. Uh, he says in verse 7 that we've been justified by His, by God's grace. We, we stood before the judge. God, the holy judge, we stood before Him guilty, condemned, deserving of His judgment because of our sin. But Paul says God justified us. God forgave our sin. He declared us to be righteous before Him through faith in Christ. And that, that little phrase that he uses, by his grace, so important. Justification is a, a grace gift, something we receive through faith in Christ. And so God has saved us, meaning he's given us new life. He's given us a new status. And then third, Paul says, we've received a new identity. A new identity, verse 7. Paul again says, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. We are no longer who we once were. If you are in Christ today, maybe it would be good for you to think about this for a second. If, if you are in Christ today, how do you think of yourself? What defines you? Uh, are you sinner? Are you dirty? Are you a failure? Maybe a nobody? Now, True, we're sinners, <laughs> but we're justified sinners, and, and that's no small thing. And you're not a nobody. You're an heir of God through Jesus Christ. You're an heir together with your elder brother, Jesus Christ. And, you know, by God's grace, we are God's adopted sons and daughters. And, and we have this glorious future ahead of us. When Paul uses this language of being heirs, he's, he's thinking about this, this future time ahead of us eternal life. We stand to inherit the, the life of the age to come, the, the new creation, resurrected, glorified bodies living in a renewed earth with God dwelling among his people forever and ever. That is who we are now in Christ. We are heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so, you know, Paul just in, in such, you know, in summary fashion, just lays out this marvelous news about what God has done for us in Christ. But, but remember, it, it's not just there so that we can get all of our theology, you know, straight. Uh, he, he brings in this good news to shape our public lives. You know, how is the life of verses 1 and 2 possible? And Paul's answer here is the gospel. His, his answer here is, Remembering, believing, living inside the new reality that God has brought about in and through Jesus Christ. And so you know, the, the personal experience of God's kindness, the, the personal experience of his generous love in Christ, it, it motivates us to treat others the same way. It motivates the kind of life he's talked about in this passage. You know, I, I was that rotten, dirty person described in verse 3, but God broke into my life with his grace and his goodness and his love, and his grace made me clean, made me new, 
gave me a new identity. I, I was unlovely and ungodly. I didn't deserve his kindness, but he's flooded my life with his goodness and his grace. And so if, if God has treated me this way, how much more should I treat fellow sinners this way? You know, how, how could my public life not be marked by, by humility and, and the gentleness of Christ when God in Christ has been so kind to me? And, and, and maybe you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but, but, but what about the issues? <laughs> you know, that shouldn't we stand for truth? Yes, of course. Have convictions. Stand by your convictions. But do it in a gospel-shaped way. Do it in a Jesus-shaped way. You know, if, if we find ourselves doing the opposite of verses 1 and 2, you know, just jumping into the culture war and resorting to slander, demonizing opponents, berating and belittling non-Christian neighbors because we don't like the way they think or the way they do things, realize the problem isn't the culture. The problem isn't the people out there. The problem is right here. It's not that they're so wrong and so wicked and so messed up that, that we have no other choice. How are we going to win? Who said anything about winning? The problem is not out there. It, it's in here. I'm suffering from gospel amnesia. I think that's a, a Paul Tripp phrase. Gospel amnesia. I, I've forgotten who I was. I've forgotten how God has treated me. I, I, I'm not living inside the gospel story. I, I bought into some other narrative. And so the solution, Paul says, let the gospel get down deeper into your heart. You know, meditate on these gospel realities. Ask God to shape your mind and heart that, that these truths we confess and believe would not just rattle around in our brains, but that they would get down into us and begin to, to change who we are in private and in public. Paul says, remember who you were. Remember God's good and kind and gentle and loving treatment of you in Christ, and, and let that form you into a good and kind and gentle person who adorns the gospel in your public life. Let me pray for us. Our God and Father, would you indeed use the wonderful good news about Jesus Christ and your goodness and loving kindness toward us, would you use that to shape us? Would you work deep in our hearts to bring about a, a gospel-shaped life, a Jesus-shaped life that glorifies you, that, that shows off the, the beauty and the wonder of your transforming grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot to think about, a lot to meditate on. A couple things I wrote down as I was listening to, uh, to Ryan this morning. Forgetfulness is always dangerous in the Christian life and gospel amnesia. And I know uh, that I suffer from that often even as a believer for 30 some years, to forget the gospel is so easy to do because of my, my weaknesses, my, my own sin, uh, my own uh, uh, struggles with uh, the things of this life. So I appreciate how Paul just, just zeroes in on the gospel for us. And I appreciate that our Heavenly Father has given us through Jesus, the reminder of the gospel through the Lord's Supper. And we have that this morning. This is one of those cures. 
for gospel amnesia, is for us to think about and meditate on the one who gave his life for us, the one whose body hung on a, hung on a cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A, a Jesus whose blood was spilt and yet covered every sin that we commit as believers. That's the wonder of the gospel, isn't it? It's glorious. It's, it's beautiful. It's, I'll quote uh, Craig, who's not in here, who always says beautiful so much. That's beautiful. The gospel is beautiful. And so this morning, one thing I'm going to mention is I hope you received uh, or you picked these up outside before you came in. This is for this, this Lord's Supper is for believers, those who are trusting in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who have, have humbled themselves and turned, turned from their sin and turned to Christ. And if that describes you this morning, you're welcome uh, to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. So the, these elements, the symbol of uh, grape juice or wine and this wafer uh, remind us of that uh, of the gospel of Jesus' body and his blood. So if you did not get one, we're not going to look at you as you go out the door and get it. So go get one. The other thing I'd, I'd encourage you to do is look to see if that wafer's in there. <laughs> I've actually been up here when it's not. And uh, it's like, uh-oh, that's, that's a quality issue. Anyway, um, so if you take a look and it's not there while we're singing our next song, go ahead and go outside and get one. Again, it, it, it's... We want you to participate uh, with us uh, this morning. So before we eat and drink together, we're going to sing uh, this song. It's on the uh, on page 10 of your uh, bulletin called Come to the Feast. And it's a, a reminder that this is a banquet of grace. And we've heard about that bank. We've heard about grace already. And it's a banquet that we enjoy together. It's a time that we celebrate. It's a time that we meditate on God's goodness to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let's join together and sing this song. You can be uh, stay seated as we sing together.
I'm going to lead us in prayer in a moment, but I'd like to give, give you an opportunity. There, there, there's a lot that goes on on Sunday mornings. Sometimes there's not a lot of just pause and just a time to just pray quietly, perhaps, to think about what we're about to do. And so I'd like you to just take this moment to quietly uh, bow your heads and, and just talk to your Father. Talk to your heavenly, heavenly Father and thank Him for His Son and for your salvation. And then I'll lead us in prayer. So I'll just give you a moment to quietly pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for your steadfast love toward us. We thank you for our Savior, the God-man who took upon himself your wrath on our behalf, who went to the cross humbly, obediently, submitting himself to you. And we thank you that because of his death, we live. And we thank you that we can remember this gospel this morning. And as Paul has told us, the love of Christ compels me. And so, Father, use this time as we, as we think about the extent of your love toward us. May that compel us to live gospel-shaped lives. And Father, maybe even more importantly this morning, we want to worship you as we eat and drink. We want to thank you and praise you and glorify you and make much of you because of what you've done for us in Christ. Yes, we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. We followed the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But you, God, being rich in mercy because of your great love with which you loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive with Christ. And by grace, we have been saved. Amen. I invite you to take uh, these symbols of Jesus' body and his blood. Take the wafer, which represents his body first. And we do this together. We don't do it in isolation. We don't do it one at a time. But we do it together as an expression of our unity, our expression of, our, of God's common grace to us, an expression of of the gospel, an expression of the gospel. So would you eat in remembrance of him this morning? Then I invite you to take uh, the cup that you have in your hands and open it. And as again, we think about the fact, the truth that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that's what Jesus has done for us. So drink this in remembrance of him this morning. If you were in Sunday school this morning with us, we talked about proclamation. And that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming the gospel to one another and to those who perhaps are, are in our midst who don't know Jesus, they've heard the gospel, they've seen the gospel, we've sung the gospel. And so we do this until the Lord comes.
comes again. He's risen. He's not dead. He is risen. We remember his death, but we look forward to his coming again. Amen? Amen. We're going to join together and sing as our final hymn this morning, O Church, Arise. And that means that if you are able, arise, stand, let's sing together. I'd say we have opportunity this week, don't we, to, uh, to live that gospel-shaped life uh, with our neighbors and our families. Um, and so may God work in us and give us grace to do just that. Our benediction this morning is from Romans chapter 15, verse 13, a wonderful, wonderful benediction. May the God of hope, may he fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So go forth in hope this morning, and by the grace of God, you're dismissed.